MZTV. The circumstances God uses to mark time. I mean, a little strange, don't you think? Jonah in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, typifying the Son of God being in the tomb three days and three nights. Jonah is spit out of the fish's mouth. I would hate to use that analogy and pull it into the Christ analogy and say, yeah, oh, Jesus was spit out of the tomb and after after three days and three nights. But, you know, I, I don't think God would be offended by that analogy. He's the one that came up with it. Christ was spit out of the tomb. But this, the, the, the disparate circumstances, Jonah trying to run away from God, trying to hide, doesn't like the fact fact he's going to preach to Nineveh that part is really strange to me that I guess I guess in that case yeah the the motive has nothing to do with it obviously the Jonah's motive but wait a minute no his motive was bad but it wasn't his motive to get swallowed by the fish that wasn't Jonah's idea that was God's idea so God changed the history of Nineveh by having Jonah swallowed by a great fish. I think he learned a lot when he was in the belly of the fish. I think he got a real education down there, a smelly one, probably a hot one and a humid one, but he came out a different man and he was ready to preach, ready to preach. Of course, he was alive and the belly of that fish our lord was dead in the belly of the earth but everything changed when he came forth just i mean these accounts cannot be of human invention and that is exciting to, to me of course many people consider jonah to be a bible story oh you see the pictures in the kids bible books Jonah being swallowed by the whale, and it's all a cute story, but it's not a cute story. It's historical fact. Jesus Christ himself references it. He references Noah, another kid's story. He references Jonah. These were historical events. So I, I just the, the, how God measures. The, three days are important to him. Three days are important, and he uses the foolishness. I think that's a connection here. We know God uses the foolishness of himself. God uses his foolishness to confound the wisdom of the wise. And what could be more foolish than typifying your own son being in the tomb for three days, typifying that by a man being swallowed by a fish and being inside the fish's belly, which seems unlikely, but I've heard tell of people being swallowed by whales or large fish. Pinocchio, for instance. Uh, no, just kidding on that. It's historically true. People have been in the belly of fish and survived and survived. If God wants to do it this way, let him do it this way. It's just another proof. And people would look at, though, people would look at the crucifixion of the Son of God and see that. They would probably see that as more foolish than the Jonah account. Think about it. The Son of God being crucified and put in a tomb for three days. This one, who, as the men on the way to Emmaus even said, this one who we thought would be the hope of Israel. This was the man we were pinning all our expectations on. So it was even more foolish. At least it was on par with the Jonah account. So this brings us to three days, and it brings us to the two-one ratio. We've been discussing for a couple weeks the 6-1 ratio interrupted by many, many sidetracks. Six days of creation, one day of stopping. 6,000 years of man working. Six being the number of man. 1,000 years of Israel entering into her day of stopping. And now we have 2,000 years since the coming of Christ. Many people think that Christ was crucified in ought 31. So 2,000 years from that date... I mean, I've heard everything from 27 to 
Well, not really 27. That's completely early. I, I've heard everything. Well, no, I think somebody has posited 27. But I think that, that's way off. But everything from 27 to 33. But I've looked into this, and uh, the people I have the most respect for, the smartest people, the most spiritual people, it seems to point to 31. And that Jesus' public ministry was three and a half years, and there's very little question that his public ministry began in 27, ought 27. So 31 is his public ministry then being three and a half years. He's crucified in 31. His second coming would be in 2031. Subtract seven years from that to allow for the seven-year tribulation. And we have the tribulation starting next fall, the fall of 2024. It's been long enough, ladies and gentlemen. It has been long enough. And it always startles me to think it's not interminable. That time seems interminable. Like, is he ever going to come? People have lived and died, lived and died, lived and died over these 2,000 years. Hell, over these 6,000 years. Where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of his coming? That's where Peter brings up the scoffers. Oh, well, you're not aware there have been some big things done. God does big things. He just waits for the time, and then the big thing happens. The Son of God came. They looked for him for thousands of years. He finally came. He lived 30 years anonymously upon this earth, and then his three and a half public, three and a half years of public ministry, and then the crucifixion, the entombment, and the resurrection that changes everything, changes universal history. Big things happen. The time does come. God is not slack concerning his promises. It has been long enough. And even though it seems interminable to the people, and sometimes days for us seems like they'll seem like they'll never end. You ever had a day like that? It seemed like it'll never end. You can't wait to lay your head down on the pillow at night. But when we look in terms of the six thousand years, it doesn't seem that long. It's like, yeah, it has a beginning and an end. It has a beginning and an end. And I want to emphasize the last part of that. It has an end. Oh, Martin, everybody says they're living in the last day. Every generation. Yeah, but one generation is going to be right. And that is us. I'm at BibleBaptistPublications.org. I apologize for that. But there's some good stuff here concerning the 2-1 ratio. What God will do on the third day, what Christ does on the third day, and the significance of the two preceding days. This section is called the third day marriage, quoting from John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the third day, why mention that? Not two, not four, the third day. Third day of what? I'm not sure. Let's go on. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. I don't know who's writing this article, but he comments, this person is not named, otherwise I would give him credit, credit where credit is due. Why does the Holy Spirit bother to mention that this marriage was on the third day, in distinction from other days? What difference does it make if it were on the third day, the second day, or the tenth, or the fifteenth day? I like this guy. I don't know who's writing. It might be a woman. I don't know. It makes a big difference in the context of our study because, because it is on the third millennial day after Calvary that the marriage of the Lamb occurs. True. When Christ receives his bride, reference Revelation 19, verse 7, to remind us that all of this is after six millennial days of human history, we see in John chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, that there were six water pots. Oh, yeah. Six water pots, and the water content of each was turned into wine. Not grape juice, Baptist. Funny. We got a Baptist guy writing here. Thank God this guy admits that it's wine, not grape juice. Thus pointing to the joy. Yes, wine pictures joy. Makes me want to get a glass. Anyway, thus pointing to the joy that Israel and the heirs of the earth will display when Christ rules on the third millennial day following Calvary. This is great. He rules on the third millennial day, and after three days, the wedding feast and the miracle occurs, and 
there's a link here between the 2-1 and the 6-1 ratio because of the six water pots, the number of man, six, the number of man, and really the number of futility. Man rules for 6,000 years, fails, fails, fails with all different forms of government. Here's six giant water pots filled with water and nothing comes of it. Nothing comes of it. Nothing comes of it times six until the touch of Christ. Christ turns the water into wine, and wine is typical of the millennial feast. Uh, our Lord said to his disciples, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. Man, I'm going to look for a three-day pass to come down here to this earth from the celestial realm to taste that wine. Why not? God will do above and beyond anything we're able to hope, expect, and think so. I want in on that. I want to be able to taste it. That's good. If you want some references concerning the third millennial day following Calvary, we have Zechariah 10, 7, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4, Deuteronomy 14, 26, Joel 2, 19, and Psalm 4, 7. This next section is called, The Lord Comes Down on the Third Day. I'm going to quote now from Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said to Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Ho, oh, that is loaded. There it is again, says the writer. The people were sanctified for two days before the Lord came down in their sight on the third day, obviously pointing to the third Millennial day after Calvary, which follows 2,000 years of Christ sanctifying a people for his name. See, that's where I'm like, mm. he's not sanctifying any Jews, any Israelites today for his name. He's not. I mean, there are still Israelites who are able to hold fast to the promises as they were exhorted to in the book of Hebrews, but let me see if I can make sense out of this. Go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Okay. All right, I got it. They're, they're sanctified. They're set apart. Sanctified is the verb form, a form of the noun for, uh, of the noun saint, of the adjective holy. So this people, in spite of their behavior, in spite of their stiff-necked stubbornness in spite of the fact that God hardened them for this past 2,000 years they're still sanctified and they in spite of what they're doing they've been sanctified so that's it I think I stumbled here when he says which follows 2,000 years of Christ sanctifying a people for his name no that sounds like Christ is actively working with the Jews today, which is not really he's actively working with the body of Christ, I would say, which follows 2,000 years of the people of God being sanctified, being set apart. But there are people in waiting, and they are people for his name. The writer goes on, but that's not all. Verses 16 through 20 offer numerous second coming references on this third day. There is the morning and the thunders and lightnings, the thick cloud and the voice of the trumpet, the smoke, the fact that the mount quaked. Then the Lord came down and Moses went up. This language, thunders, lightning, the cloud, voice of the trumpet, the smoke, the mountain quaked. This to me, this writer doesn't mention it here for some strange reason but this screams to me the tribulation and the earth is going to quake there will be earthquakes in diverse places there will be a giant earthquake that will knock down all the cities of the earth and of course the clouds the smoke and the trumpets this next section is called the third day house of the Lord. I think I'm going to stop here because the next section, section uh, they're called the Good Samaritans, two pence. I'm going to, don't know what that's about. I'm going to have to read that ahead of time. I don't like reading these things ahead of time because I like to respond spontaneously. I don't like to have everything ironed out. I like to be surprised by the writer. I want you to see my surprise like we just did with Sanctified there and then work through it together. 
like a Bible study, which is this is. I feel like we're all contributing, even though I'm not hearing you. I'm not seeing you. I'm looking into a camera. There's a stove right behind me. <laughs> but I'm not alone. That's the weird thing about this show. I don't feel alone. I feel like I'm connected with all of you. It is amazing. It really seems like a miracle. And I don't know how it happens, but I become animated as soon as I turn this camera on and turn this microphone on. I'm animated. I could be totally wiped out, totally forlorn. Sometimes I don't quite get it back. You know that. Sometimes I go through the whole show being uh, dampened. But today and most days, as soon as this camera comes on, I feel like you're here. You're sitting at my table with me and we're having a Bible study. This section is called the third day house of the Lord. In 2 Kings 20, verse 5, God assured Hezekiah that he would heal him of his sickness by saying, Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you will go up into the house of the Lord. The writer comments again. We see two days of healing. Fee, I would argue with that. Let's go on. And then a completion on the third day. No, he doesn't say he's healing him during the two days. Behold, I will. I'm going to, you know, I'm, this guy's going from the King James. I'm going to have to go to 2 Kings 20, verse 5 from the concordant version. All right, this is definitely a live Bible study. 2 Kings 25. Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the governor of my people, thus speaks Yahweh. The Elohim of your father, David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I am healing you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of Yahweh. I am healing you. This is the incomplete verb form here. So... I'm learning something here. Apparently, during this 2,000 years of Israel's apostasy, it's like God has not forsaken them. He has cast them away, but he has not thrust them away. It's only on the third day that they shall go up, that Hezekiah was to go up to the house of Yahweh. So during the two days previous, he's not healed yet. It's called, I am healing you. The only way I can see this is that it touches the sovereignty of God. Every single step, a man's steps are ordered by God. Every single step that this errant people take during the 2,000 years since Christ, the 2,000 years of their apostasy and their hardening, is part of their healing. It is a prerequisite for their healing and that's true of all of us the stubbornness must come first right romans eleven thirty two. god locks up altogether in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all and when we see god locking up altogether in stubbornness it's not as though he throws them in a lock box and goes away they are being stubborn but their stubbornness does it sound like i'm stretching here i don't i don't think so their stubbornness is active and it is part of their healing. They are becoming healed and part of the healing process, strange as it may sound, is a furtherance of the disease. And there is some sort of active learning on the part of Israel as they're walking through. I mean, I, I run past this crazy jewish place on las olas boulevard on my run every day it's this the synagogue thing it's kind of like a jewish school of some kind and i see these some not completely traditional jews but definitely jews with the beards and some are wearing the yarmulke and they're all hanging outside and, and every time i walk by every time i run by i'm just like thinking oh these poor people my god they're all locked up in stubbornness Yet every single day of their stubbornness is necessary. It's actually, I think we can look at it this way, part of their healing. It's part of their healing. 
it's part of the mercy to be shown everyone that they go through this stubbornness. God locks up altogether in stubbornness, but they're being stubborn. They're being stubborn. It's And God is actively in it, and it's part of the process of the healing. That's a better way to look at it. You're looking at the outcome, the healing, and you're applying the outcome to the process. In that, the process is absolutely necessary for the healing. Whew. I think I worked through that. That was rough. Thanks for hanging in there with me on that. I think we got something there. Let's finish this section here, and then I will departe vous for the week. Christ began healing sinners at his first coming, and he continues healing sinners for 2,000 years. See? He's looking at it the wrong way. He's seeing this as some kind of active healing, like the actual healing is taking place. But why did Hezekiah not go up until the third day? He wasn't healed until then. So he's not healing sinners. He's making them more stubborn in the case of Israel for 2,000 years. Then the house of the Lord is established in the third millennial day after Calvary. Yeah, if they're healed during the 2,000 years, why isn't the millennial time established then? It's because they're still going through this process of being stiff-necked. And this tells me every single day of it is required. Like, isn't it enough? We say this about evil isn't there enough evil isn't it enough isn't it enough but it's not static evil it's ongoing and god is looking at it as part of the deliverance so it's active evil it's like every single day of it every single minute of it is necessary and not a single minute extra will be added to it i like this really to think of it Think to see even light in the darkness, and that the darkness is part of the coming light, in that it's necessary. Contrast. Then the house of the Lord is established in the third millennial day after Calvary, which is the seventh and final millennial day from the creation. That is the creation of Adam. And the reference given here is Micah 4 1, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it.